Good morning, everyone. Hear these words from Psalm 62. My soul finds rest in God alone. My salvation comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. It's a good word during these challenging days. We keep saying that one of these days. Hopefully it won't feel so challenging. But uh, we have a sure foundation, and he's invited us into his presence. I'm so glad you've braved the elements and joined us. And I'm so glad that you're tuning in uh, at home or wherever you're at. I uh, just believe that the Lord has a word for us today. It's going to be a good day. Uh, if you're a guest, if you're new to us here or on our, our live stream, I encourage you to go to our website, fill out a Connect card so we know who you are, so we can pray for you, and uh, we have a little gift we'd like to send you as well, so I encourage you to do that. God is good. All the time, man. He has given us his son. He has given us his spirit. And there's one more pretty awesome gift he's, he's given to us, me more than you. He's given us Tracy Dolash King. And she's supposed to be here so I can introduce you to her in case you don't know her, but she's probably mingling. She's so chatty, uh, so social, and that's one of the great things about her. But uh, um, we're blessed to have her among us. There she is. Where is where? Now I'm going to stall so they can get up and see what 55 is supposed to look like. Now, some of you are saying, I can't believe you shared your wife's age, but come on. We, we all have things about us that, you know, we shouldn't be ashamed of. It's who we are. So come here, wife. And Sorry, I was talking. Yep, yep. So I wasn't late. Happy birthday. Thank oh, you. God bless you. All right. Would you stand as we uh, confess our faith together? Christ has died. Christ is coming again. Hallelujah. Before we pray uh, for our live stream audience, those here have already seen the elements, but we're going to be taking communion later in the service. And if you haven't already, I encourage you to gather juice and bread. And if you don't have that, just get some water so we can remember together what Christ has done for us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we can gather in your house and uh, wherever we are, God, we join our hearts in tuning into your voice. But first, we want to honor you and hallow your name for you are worthy and you are good. Uh, you've been especially good to me, but God, we can all look at our lives and, uh, and give thanks for your provision and protection and uh, family and friends and education, Lord. So many good things you give us. You're a good father and you do want to give us more of yourself. So may we receive your gifts today. Just bless each one here and bless those who couldn't be here, God. Make every home a sanctuary today. Be glorified in all that's said and done. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Remain standing as we worship the Lord. Amen. Yeah, we lift up a shout of praise to the Lord. All God's people said, praise, praise the Lord. Lord. And all God's people said, praise, praise the Lord. Lord. All God's people said, praise the Lord. Yeah. We praise you this morning. Okay. worship our King, and come let us bow at His feet, He has done great things, oh see what our Savior has done, and see how His love overcomes, He has done great things, yes, He has done great things. Done great 
Good to be in his house with you this morning as we sing his praises together.
It's good news for us today, amen, that he has overcome and he provides in us uh, that same strength to overcome uh, what we face this morning.
just say that together. Oh, great are you. One more time. Oh, so great. Great are you. Amen. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we just come to you this morning. First, to just tell you how, how great you are, Lord. Hallowed be thy name in all of the earth. And Lord, we just uh, humble ourselves this morning to say not what we want, not our will, Lord, but your will be done here on earth, even as you have described it in the kingdom of heaven. And God, would you just give us uh, what we need for this day? Help us not to lament the past or hold too closely to the future, Lord, but, but Lord, just cling to you in these moments and trust in you for what you have for us uh, today. And Lord, we just ask as we face um, trials and temptations in this life, help us not to succumb to those. Uh, Lord, give us the strength that we need um, to live each day for you um, and deliver us from the hands of the evil one. For the power and the honor and the glory and the worthiness forever is yours. And we turn it back to you in praise this morning. We pray all of these things in the precious name of the one who saved us, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. Huh. Well, good morning, everybody. How y'all doing today? Eh. <clears throat> Lammy, I'm sorry, what? Eh. <laughs> Are you not doing well today? Well, to be honest... No. Oh, well, I'm sorry to hear that. Why, why aren't you doing well? Honestly? Yeah. Terrible. <coughs> wow, terrible. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, why are you doing terrible? I'm starving. You're starving? Yeah, on the brink of death. Okay, let's start on the brink of death? Yeah. Let me, there's no way you're on the brink of death. How do you know? Because last night, we definitely had food, and you spilled all over the room floor. Remember that? Oh, yeah. So you're not starving. Well, I didn't eat this morning. <clears throat> Why didn't you eat this morning? I chose not to. Uh, oh, wait. Oh, oh, so you're fasting. What? Well, fasting, right? When you choose to deny yourself something, usually food, but it could be anything for a higher purpose. Are you fasting? I mean, I suppose so. Oh, great. Well, so why are you fasting? Are you fasting to hear better from God? <laughs> no. Wow. Okay, um... Oh, are you trying to break a bad habit? Are you trying to stop sinning or, or something you're trying to not do that's wrong? No, I'm basically perfect. <laughs> okay, well, we'll talk about your perfect humility later. <clears throat> but, uh, okay, well, fasting for a higher purpose, right? Yeah. Are you trying to lose weight again? What? I, I'm not saying you're fat. I'm just saying last week you mentioned you wanted to lose 10 pounds, right? Well, yeah, but rude. <sighs> okay, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm just asking. <laughs> Okay, so help me out. Why are you fasting, Lammy? I have no idea. What's your higher purpose? Well, it's simple. It is, isn't it? Sure. Uh, which is what? Church. What? Let me tell you. Yeah, please do. Well, I overslept. You were leaving, so I didn't eat breakfast. Oh, oh, oh wait, wait. So you overslept, and you didn't eat because you wanted to catch the bus, right? Yeah, I can't walk to church. Right, but I, right, you can't walk to church, but like you wanted to come with me, that's why you didn't eat breakfast. Yeah. I mean, that's good. I'm glad you picked church over breakfast, but that's not actually fasting. That's not the point of fasting. Well, what is? You know, Pastor Dave is actually going to talk about this very thing this morning, and I bet you he can help you and me and all of us better understand what it means to fast. So let's listen to Pastor Dave. Okay. Poor Lammy. We're having, we're having snacks in a little while. That's what kids call the communion elements. So, so when, uh, when I opened chapter 2 of Mark's gospel, I was excited because there's so much great stuff there. You got the, uh, 
healing of the paralyzed man and the four faithful friends. I love that story. And then the calling of Matthew, the tax collector, you know. (laughs) There's a lot that I could say that the Lord could say to us from those texts. And I wish he would today, but he kind of laid this subject on my heart. And I kept trying to talk him out of it. But just this morning, during my quiet time, and you know, I was reading some scripture verses in a devotional guide, and two of the three were about fasting. So that's where we're going. Um, since you know, some of you are here in person, I doubt you're going to get up and leave, but I encourage our live stream audience to stay with us, because I think, I know that God wants to help us today. It's about Jesus, all right? It's not some, you know, spiritual discipline for super saints. It's a means of grace. So let's look at Mark chapter 2. We'll be getting with verse 18. We're just going to look at a few verses. Mark 2, verses 18 through 22. I invite you to stand for the reading of the word. Uh, I failed to mention we have these notes sheets, fill-in sheets available at the table when you come in our ministry center. One of these days, I'm going to figure out how to put it online for our virtual audience. But hear the word of the Lord. Once when John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, some people came to Jesus and asked, why don't your disciples fast like John's disciples and the Pharisees do? Jesus replied, do wedding guests fast while celebrating the groom? Of course not. They can't fast while the groom is with them, but someday the groom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. Besides, who would patch old clothing with new cloth? For the patch would shrink and rip away from the old cloth, leaving an even bigger tear than before. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, for the wine would burst the wineskins, and the wine and the skins would both be lost. New wine calls for new wineskins. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Are you buckled and ready? We've got uh, some ground to cover. Um, So let's dive in. Fasting, if we, you know, we're trying to succinctly describe what it is, it's it's self-denial. Typically, denial of food. That's, I think, what most of us think of. When we think of fasting, going without eating for a period of time, or maybe certain foods like Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. They fasted from the king's rich food, you know, the the prime rib and the, the desserts and stuff like that. You can also fast sleep. Jesus did. He called his disciples to do that as well. Paul talks about fasting from sex would be an interesting sermon for another day, but you can look that up in 1 Corinthians 7. And I think we can think of dozens of things in our lives, distractions really, good things that maybe it would do us well to set aside for a period of time, TV, internet, social media, etc. Why? Why would anyone deny themselves things they enjoy, maybe things they need. Some people do it for uh, repentance. When the weight of, of sin is heavy upon them. A good example are the, the Ninevites in the Old Testament. We read about them in the, the book of Jonah. They were burdened with their sin and, frankly, concerned about God's coming judgment. So the king ordered all the the citizens of Nineveh and the animals to not eat, to, to fast for a period of time. Sometimes sin is so heavy, you just have to get radical. Some fast for, for healing. Um, again, we read an example in the Bible, in the Old Testament. King David fasted when his preborn son was probably going to die. You've got to be careful 
you know, to um, not view this as a way to make God do something we want him to do, because in the end, um, we can't force God's hand. We want his will to be done. But, but David, in response to the question, why are you fasting, said, perhaps through this, through, you know, my, my um, sacrifice to my focus on God, the Lord will be gracious to me and let the child live. We find fasting for guidance in the New Testament. The early church wanted to get it right. They, they knew what was at stake. They wanted to know who was supposed to go to certain places, you know, which missionaries were to go where. So together they, they, they fasted and sought the Lord some decisions, you know, are, are pretty important in our lives and maybe, you know, merit uh, a little more focus, a little more fervency and urgency. You can fast for grief. It's almost a natural thing when, when we've experienced a great tragedy, a great loss to kind of lose our appetite. David fasted when King Saul and his son Jonathan died. But I think uh, the grief we see more of or should see more of in the Bible is the grief for, like, the condition of the nation. When the Israelites had lost their way, when they had strayed from God's path, they, they were so distraught so ashamed, again, so repentant that they underwent uh, a time of fasting, not eating. And the last thing, other reasons, we're not going to get into the health benefits of fasting today, but some would just fast for change. They don't like the way their life is headed or the church is headed or the nation's headed. It's like we've got to do something. In the book of Esther, one of the Old Testament books, the Persian king Xerxes had signed an edict that would result in the extermination of all the Jews. So Queen Esther approached her, her countrymen and said, you need to fast. I mean, there's, the stakes couldn't be higher so get serious, get focused, and maybe we can, we can bring about change. We can reverse this edict. Great stories that I wish we had time for. So there's just some reasons why people would um, sacrifice meals or sleep or other things they enjoy, you know, to accomplish higher purposes. Why did the Pharisees fast? It's how our text begins. Just a reminder that, that they and John's disciples, John the Baptist's disciples, his followers, regularly fasted. But I like John the Baptist, and I, I think, you know, he's, his disciples probably were, were good men, godly men, so I don't want to make them look bad. So we'll just pick on the Pharisees, because no one likes the Pharisees, right? But make it clear, it's Pharisees and John's disciples who are active fasters, and it's a contrast with Jesus' disciples. So the question is, why did they fast? And again, we, we don't want to think any good things about the Pharisees, but the fact of the matter is, many of these devout Jews were good and godly men. Nicodemus, we learn about, Gamaliel, I mean, there are others, you know, who, who really seem to have a heart for God. They probably fasted for repentance, for healing, for change. Hey, uh, I'm going to pause for just a second, because uh, can we get a little more light? Because I, I think people have a hard time taking notes. I, I saw a light there, and that made me, there we go. All right, uh, thank you. All right, so, you know, we got to give some of these Pharisees the benefit of the doubt. And it was a part of their tradition or religion in the Torah. 
the Old Testament scriptures in, in the Mishnah, the, the elaboration, the commentary on the law. This was, you know, their guidebook. They, they were supposed to fast. Good Jews fasted on Yom Kippur. And Pharisees and John's disciples obviously fasted way more often than that. And I think that's okay. I, I wish we could get away with that. Like, say, all right, on Mother's Day, we're having an all-church fast. Now, that'd be a bad day to call it fast. But, you know, like, we, we had, had these traditions where we were all in it together. There's power in that. There's value in traditions, in, in liturgy, in, in aligning ourselves with what faithful men and women have done in the past. But here it takes a turn. Because we kind of get the sense that Pharisees fasted to impress people. They made a production out of it. At least some did. That's why Jesus kind of calls them out in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, when you fast, you know, don't, you know, don't act like, you know, don't, don't let the world know you're doing this. This is between you and God. You know, wash your face, comb your hair, carry about your fairly normal activities. And there's one Pharisee who, who boasts in the Gospels that he fasts twice a week. But it seemed to work because the people who approached Jesus on this day obviously thought that the Pharisees and John's disciples were pretty spiritual dudes. Like, this is what, you know, good Christians look like, and your disciples aren't doing that. So what's the deal? Why don't your disciples fast more often or the right way? And the answer is clear. You know, Jesus articulates it, but I think it's kind of the point today. Because Jesus was present. He was with them. I mean, they'd been waiting for Jesus for centuries as, as a nation. And, and surely these men had been waiting their whole lifetime for the Messiah to come, the Christ. It's the anointed one of God. And now he's with them. You ever been to a, a wedding reception um, I mean, in recent history, they're, they're really painful because uh, you sit there for an hour waiting for the wedding party to show up because they're off taking pictures and, and you're looking at all that great food and you can't eat any of it. And that's not exactly fasting. But, you know, when the, the wedding party shows up with much fanfare, it's time to party, right? Jesus is, is present He's doing his Jesus thing. He's teaching and healing and helping and rebuking. And, and these were good days. So this was a time for feasting. But Jesus contrasts, you know, that, that's what's happening today. But there's coming a day when I won't be with them. And fasting is, is appropriate then. You know, he's anticipating his death, you know, just a great tragedy, traumatic event, followed by his resurrection, but then he leaves. He ascends back into heaven, and he's gone, and that's where we live. Jesus is gone physically, just reality. He's not here among us in the flesh. And it's not the same. I mean, if we love him like we're supposed to, if we get who he is and what he's done for us, that is, you know, by his stripes that we are healed through his death, we have life. He rescued us from a fate we deserved. He is the lover of our souls, the friend who sticks closer than a brother. He, he is all that and more. And he's not here. 
And it, it's not okay. I mean, it's what we're stuck with, but... Now, those of you who have been around a while have, have heard me talk like this, and I got this from a book I'll reference in a minute, but <clears throat> it's appropriate to mourn. And an expression of that is, is fasting for... Because Jesus is absent. The, the, the groom is not at the wedding yet. I mean, one day, as Paul writes in Corinthians... What we see now only incompletely, we will see fully, perfectly. Um, we, we only know him so well now, but someday our knowledge will be complete. I like to plan trips. I, I, I'm pretty good at it. I've told, you know, we're thinking of going to Sedona for a few days this year. And, and we start looking at pictures, uh, Brochures. No one actually looks at brochures anymore. But on, on the internet, you can, you can learn all kinds of stuff about where you're going and get the, gets the juices flowing. That's going to be awesome and we're so excited. But if that's all we ever did, you know, just talk about it, just look at pictures and read brochures, I mean, we'd never experience the real joy, the you know, the ecstasy of these cool places. So it's hard to know what it will be like, but it'll be better than anything we could ever know in this life. When we see him face to face, when we are finally complete in him. But until that day, Jesus says fasting is a good thing to do. The book I'm referencing is called Mourning for the Bridegroom uh, by Dana Candler. I don't know if you can put it on the, 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 the live stream. I think you could order it on Amazon. You can order anything. And if you want to borrow it. If, if, so when I heard her speak once and got the book, it just started to help me see how attached to this world I really am. Like, we don't feel the ache because we just have such great lives here and now. And we need that perspective. We, we need to live with that ache that this isn't all there is. This, this isn't close to all there is. Well, part of the gospel, the good news, is that we are not alone. Jesus isn't physically with us, but he is present spiritually. He told his disciples... I'm not going to leave you as orphans. It's John 14, 18. When I go, I'm going to send my spirit, the Holy Spirit. It's the spirit of Jesus, the spirit of God. It's a distinct person of the Trinity, the triune Godhead. But it's the spirit of, of Jesus. And then you'll never be alone. I, I'm with you always, he says. And that's why we worship, because we believe he's with us. That's why we pray, because he hears us. He is present through his spirit. There's no place we can go where he is not. Probably deserve more than one amen, but no, I'll let you slide. But here's the question. Is what we experience in our lives, in our church, enough of him? How present is he? Are there degrees? I mean, I hear a lot. You know, he's everywhere. We don't need to invoke his presence. We don't need to invite him in because he is here. That's what we believe. But I think there's more available to us. Some talk about the manifest presence of God, of Jesus. I mean, we're going to unpack that. So hopefully it'll make sense. But I'm not content with the way things are in, in my own life. 
I have those moments when he is so near and I can hear his voice, not literally, but but there are a lot of days like, where are you, Jesus? And I may worry even more about what happens here in this place. Is he working as much as he wants to and could? And, and don't even get me started about the nation we live in. Who could say, I mean, maybe some of you feel that way, but are we looking at anything like the kingdom of God? You know, and there are pockets, and there are good things happening, but wow, we need Jesus Amen. to move in this, in this nation of ours. He's our only hope. Ain't no politician going to save the day, I guarantee. Amen. Jesus is our hope, but he's not, from my vantage point, doing much. And is that his choice or is that on us? Should we be seeking more of his presence? Now, obviously, I think we should. If you disagree, then I've probably wasted a half hour of your life. But I think he wants to move in our lives, in our church, in our nation, in a greater way. Uh-oh. Nope. Okay. So what does that look like? I, I was just reading Mark 2, seeing Jesus do his Jesus stuff and thought, I think that can still happen. It can still save people. When, when he is near, lives are changed, right? I mean, the lost get found. That's, that's why he's come, to seek and to save the lost. And and that happens occasionally. We celebrate new births two or three times a year. Some churches can't say that, but I want more. I, I want there to be a line of people waiting to get baptized, you know. I mean, there's a lot of lost people around us. Um. When he shows up, I think people get convicted and, you know, they still have a choice, but I, I think there's a movement, a greater movement toward him. I, I want to see that. I want Oakland to be known as a place where the lost get found. Amen. Can they get healed? George and I talk a lot about that. I, I haven't seen much of that, but at least physical healings, I believe they can happen. But emotional healing, marital healing, you know, uh, broken people being made whole, that definitely can happen and should happen and will happen when he shows up. We just can't be content with People, you know, falling by the wayside because they're overwhelmed with their problems. This is the place you get help because you meet Jesus and things change. It's got to be that way. Don't you have friends who, who need help and, and when you love to, to believe, you, you get them to church and something's going to change. And the next thing, you know, that we didn't read those verses, but paralytic gets saved and healed. And then uh, Matthew gets called. And I, I'd like to see that. I'd like to see people, maybe like you people, hear God's voice to say, I have something I want you to do. And he's just so on the, in this house, it's like, oh, pff, how can I say no? <laughs> and I'm not just talking about preaching and 
going to Peru, as awesome as that is, Brooke. I mean, you still have to do taxes and, um, you know, deliver mail and, and all the cool things you do. But to say, I'm, I'm called, I'm a representative of Jesus Christ, and, and you are, but, you know, to regularly hear it, that's, that's who I am. I have a job, but, but my vocation is to make Jesus known. And I've, I'm following him, no matter what it costs. Joy, that, that needs to happen. We read, they were all amazed and praised God because Jesus was in the house. He was, he was doing his Jesus thing. And, and I've been in those spaces. And, you know, I, I didn't know how to carefully keep us from equating Jesus' presence with, like, gospel goosebumps. I mean, that happens. You know, I love emotion. It's a part of us. We should feel it, but it's more than just emotion. So don't just feel like, you know, if Jesus shows up, you have to cry. But I think when he shows up, when we come to church and he is moving in our midst, you can't help but sing. And, and maybe that hand kind of comes unloose, you know, and, and, and maybe a tear will fall. And you don't care what anyone else thinks because you're worshiping Jesus and you're just so overwhelmed that the God of the universe and the one who saved your soul has drawn near to you and us this day. I mean, I want, I want services I'm greedy every week where it's like I can't wait to be in his presence. Best hour of the week. And, you know, some people get ticked off because the enemy doesn't like it when Jesus shows up and changes lives. There's pushback. That happens. It should not distress us when... People get upset and legislators legislate because that tells us we're doing something right, okay? We have an enemy. He's going to fight to the bitter end. Let's give him something to fight against. That's a good place for a little amen if you got one in you. <laughs> But what can we do? Let's not settle. And you probably kind of guessed where I'm headed. And, and really, it's not like, thou shalt fast. <laughs> but here's the deal. I believe desperation draws Jesus nearer. Great preacher and writer A.W. Tozier said, he waits To be wanted. And when we say, I, I have to have you. I need you. <laughs> then maybe we're in a posture to, um, I don't know, pay the price, lay the groundwork. I, I, it's not a works thing. Just think that God has given us some tools, some weapons that we probably need to consider in light of the condition of our nation and our church. Oh, almost forgot this verse. You will find me when you seek me with all your heart. But, you know, maybe it's time to Turn the TV off for a few days. Skip a lunch once in a while. Get up early and come to prayer. I don't know. That's on you. That's just what God told me to say. But we are not helpless, church. We don't have to sit 
passively by and accept the death of our nation and our church. We can do something about it. Have I gone too long? Yeah. (laughs) Just one more slide, just some practical pointers, because some of you may actually be thinking, okay, I hear you, God, (laughs) and I really do want you. I have no clue what that means. I've never done it. Be set realistic goals. I mean, don't say I'm gonna fast for 30 days if you've never fasted. A meal before, I, but you know, God inspired. It's not easy. It's hard. It's kind of the point. <laughs> and make a plan. And <laughs> I'm a planner, so this is what I do. But it's like, all right, I'm going to start after this meal. I'm going to eat with my family, or you know, don't don't overeat. That's never good. But and then I'm skipping this meal or, or these next three meals. And then I'm breaking fast this day. And during these meals, I'm going to sit with my family and drink water and smile. Or I'm not going to be anywhere near the food. Just make a plan. Think it through. If you need help, you know, let me know. Not that I'm a fasting expert by any means. But one of the, the keys is, is to seek the Lord. It's like, I have this time. I would be doing this, but I'm not doing this. So, you know, get the Bible open. Get a pad of paper out and write down what he's saying and talk to him, listen to his voice, seek the Lord. That's why we, you know, clear the clutter so we can draw closer to him. And don't feel like it's going to be some mountaintop spiritual experience, man. The, the carnality just comes flooding to the surface when you fast. It's terrifying. It's like, wow, I didn't know I was this pathetic. It's a common reality <laughs> that I face. <laughs> and God said, yeah, but you're on the right track. And you know, don't give up. Like, I tried it once. I can't do it. I'm weak. Give yourself some grace because God does. I, I think it's a heart thing. God, I want to draw closer to you and I'm willing to make some changes and, and inconvenience myself. And He'll honor that. So, that's all I got for you. Let's pray. God, what a hopeful word that if we seek you, Jesus, when we, when we get serious about encountering you, drawing closer to you, you show up. And the reality is you may be right near us anyway. We just can't see you because of all the clutter in our lives and uh, You want to help us, and you want to help people we love and are burdened for. So show us what to do. We're hungry for you. I'm falling.
So he comes to us today at the table. Beyond any feeling or emotion, we have this physical reminder that he is with us. So I encourage you to to take the elements and you can gently uh, remove the top little layer of plastic, the, the clear plastic. Don't pull the foil off yet because it's a little harder but to hold that until I've instructed you to take it the communion supper instituted by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is a sacrament which proclaims his life his suffering his sacrificial death and resurrection and the hope of his coming again the supper is a means of grace in which Christ is present by the spirit It is to be received in reverent appreciation and gratefulness for the work of Christ. All those who have truly repentant, who are truly repentant, forsaken their sins, and believe in Christ for salvation are invited to participate in the death and resurrection of Christ. We come to the table that we may be renewed in life and salvation and may be made one by the Spirit. So God, we thank you for this ancient sacrament and the significance of it. We acknowledge that Jesus' body was broken for us and his blood was shed so that we could be forgiven, so that we could be reconciled to you and become your children. We could be citizens of the heavenly kingdom here and now. And someday be with you forever, God. We celebrate the hope that we have because of Jesus. And I pray that you will consecrate, you will bless these elements. Just a morsel of bread, a sip of juice. But may through them Jesus draw near. In his name we pray. Amen. So let us take the body of Christ broken for you. May it preserve you blameless under under our everlasting life. Let's eat this. And now it's good just to pull the foil back a, a little bit, you know, to completely remove it, just to, enough to sip the juice, which represents the blood of Christ shed for you. Drink this in remembrance for what Christ has done and be thankful. 
Thanks be to God. Yeah, I think there's um, moments that God intervenes. You know, we have we have our plans and thoughts for a given service or time, and and then there's moments where God just kind of impresses upon uh, someone, um, maybe change plans. And so uh, this what we're song we're going to do is. One that was kind of a late impression, um, I'm going to, Paul, and I see you back there, David, I can't tell if that's David over there, can you come on up and maybe just help us with uh, some of the dynamics on this song, it's uh, Waymaker, I'm not sure if you know that song, but it's a pretty simple song, uh, but it just speaks to the Lord's presence and his ability to move in our, in our lives, um, and I'll sing a little bit, we'll have the words up on the, the screen, um, but we're just going to play this a little bit and uh, worship the Lord. You are here moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here working in this place. I worship you, I worship you. Sing it again. You are here, moving it now. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship because you are maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. 
You are here, you are here, touching every heart. I worship you, I worship you. Turning lives around, you are here, turning lives, turning lives around. Yes, I worship you. No, Lord, I worship you. promise keeper and light in the darkness my god that is who you are oh yes you are we make the miracle work promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you are that is who that is who you are that is who you are. That is who you are. That is who you are. And you are we maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. Amen. You may be seated. En tres, dos, uno. In Oakland, I hope everyone's looking forward to Pastor Milton Gay's virtual visit next Sunday morning. He'll be coming in via Zoom. I will have an interpreter there. It's all going to happen during that normal Sunday service hour. We're so excited to hear from him what he sees God doing uh, throughout the Mesoamerican region and in the world during this strange and unusual COVID time. You know, when we invite missionaries to Oakland, we often ask them if there's a project or a cause close to their heart that we can come alongside and partner with them to achieve. And when I asked Milton if there was anything like this on his mind, he knew exactly what he was hoping that we could help with. This is Pastor Sarida Valencia. She and her husband are the pastors at the local Nazarene church in Santa Tecla. Now, a couple of years ago, Pastor Zoraida was diagnosed with cancer, and since then she's been going through chemotherapy, and in addition to the obvious physical and emotional expenses of this, it's, it's been a very financially expensive time as well. Pastor Zoraida and her family have been living in a rented home uh, that's just cost a lot of money to live in, and the church recently had an idea, what if they could build a pastorage or a little apartment right in the church. So that's what they've been working on and they're about done. We've got some pictures here showing the progress. They need about five thousand more dollars to be able to finish uh, the floor, the electricity, and the windows. So Milton asked us right off the bat if this is something we'd be able to help with, especially since it's a town and a church that our people know. Every dollar that you're able to give is going to be a blessing to this family in the form of a bag of cement, a floorboard, or a window. It's a great thing to come together to be able to build an affordable and safe place for this family to live. If you'd like to give today, you can simply mark your gift as Pastor's House. You can also give online. It'll be under the missions drop down on the Oakland Church website. And next week, Milton will be telling us a little more details about this cause, and you'll have another opportunity to give. Nos gustaría que ustedes fueran parte de este gran proyecto. Todo lo que ustedes puedan dar con gozo es una bendición. Oramos para que Dios les bendiga y les multiplique. Los queremos mucho. I'm excited, Milton. Such an awesome guy. Top 10 ever, ever made. So it's going to be a fun Sunday and hope we can help with this project. Uh, thank you for being here today and, and watching us on the live stream. And, and just a little warning, when Jesus starts showing up, you never know what's going to happen, all right? Uh, phones start ringing, and <laughs> people, start, people start coming to the altar, and anyway, I'm, I'm excited, and let's just seek the Lord together. Thank you, as always, for your faithful financial support. Uh, the offering boxes are on the outside tables, and you can give online, uh, text to give, or mail checks to the church. Just a reminder, you've been so faithful, so... Thank you again. And um, two weeks from today, starting in February, we will return to the two-service schedule. Um, 
Early service will be mask mandatory at 8.30. Um, hope many of you will show up then so we have a, a good group. Um, Sunday school between, we call it the sandwich schedule. And then the, the mask optional service at 11 o'clock. We, we think it's appropriate step at this time. Um, and uh, let's, let's continue to be um, what's num- nimble and roll with the changes. God will bless you for it. Let's stand and let me, uh, let me offer a prayer as we go. God, we thank you for this good day and feel like that you helped us. And I think the best is yet to come. But it's not automatic and it's not up to me, God. So help everyone here to see how they can be a part of furthering your kingdom. God, um, we are not helpless. Comfort those who mourn today, God. We're, we're pa- uh, mourning the, the passing of Bob Filer. Um, just uh, know that he knew you, he loved you, and his future is going to be pretty awesome. But be with the families they mourn. Be with Elaine's family, Elaine Fritch, mourning uh, a grandfather, and, and Wayne and his family mourning the passing of an aunt. God, you know our needs. Touch Sick bodies, God, be with the Lewises today and continue to be with Cleo and Cheryl O'Donnell and her cancer treatments and all those, Lord, who need your touch. Just be at work in healing ways in our lives, Lord. Um, We'll give you the glory. Even if things don't work out like we would like, you are good and worthy of praise. We do pray for our nation and our new president, Lord, he needs your help just Um, guide him. May he have the wisdom to seek you, Lord. You've promised wisdom for those who ask. He, like all of us, need to acknowledge our desperate need for your help. Just be with him and our congressional leaders and, and all those who lead our nation. Lord, may they do it your way for your glory. Use this this week to be light in dark places. Uh, give us the confidence that you go with us and nothing is too hard for you. We love you and pray in Christ's name. Amen. Go in peace.